The Yeti, once better known in the West as the Abominable Snowman, is a mysterious alleged bipedal creature said to live in the Himalayan mountains. It is best known for the mysterious tracks it leaves in the snow high in the mountains, but is also said to dwell in the forested valleys below the snow line. And despite dozens of sightings and expeditions into the remote mountain regions of Tibet and Nepal, the existence of the Yeti still remains unproven today. Hello, and welcome to Unknown History. In this documentary, we will cover the history of the Yeti, starting with its mentions in local folklore and up until its first recorded appearances in history, all the way until our modern day. We will then also explore some explanations from modern science regarding the Yeti sightings and what may actually be occurring high in the Himalayan mountains. First, before we begin this documentary, we must note that the Yeti is only one of the world's several supposed ape men. Elsewhere in the world, such as in North America, people told tales of Bigfoot or Sasquatch, and sightings of similar creatures have been reported for thousands of years on all continents of the Earth. There are also stories and sightings of creatures known as the Alma and Yeren that are reportedly very similar to the Yeti that appear on the Asian continent, which are beyond the scope of this video. For this documentary's purposes, we will only be reviewing sightings of the creature called the Yeti that originate from the Himalayan mountain range in the countries such as Tibet, Nepal, Bhutan, and northern India. The Himalayas is a region flush with wildlife, where tigers, bears, and wild dogs roam in thick mountain forests, icy mountaintops, and remote river valleys, and is home to the tallest mountains in the world. Long before the Yeti made its appearances in memoirs, reports, and travelogues of British explorers, naturalists, and journalists, it was a well-known figure in the myths, legends, folklores, and folktales of several communities living in the Himalayas. The term Yeti itself is a merger of the Sherpa words Ya, which means rock or cliff, and Te, which means animal, roughly translating to mean cliff or rock creature, a fitting name as the Yeti is commonly sighted in boulder fields high in the mountains. However, some researchers have also deduced that the term Yeti may come from a Sanskrit translation of the word Yaksha, which is a hairy being with supernatural strength from Hindu mythology. And while in the modern day the Yeti is the most commonly used name for the creature, the Himalayan peoples and their communities refer to the creature with dozens of different names that are likely thousands of years old. Sightings of the Yeti among the Himalayan people have been happening for thousands of years. The tales likely predate any system of writing in the area. The Yeti is described physically as a large creature, foul-smelling, and emitting high-pitched whistles and being covered in reddish-brown hair. It is said to have a hairless face and has a biped that walks on two legs, looking something like a mix between a bear, a man, and an ape, or perhaps exhibiting qualities of all three. The Yeti is relatively short compared to North America's Bigfoot or other similar reported creatures, averaging only a height of 6 feet or 1.8 meters. Although this is only the most common reported height, and Yetis have been reported to come in a variety of shapes and sizes, the Yeti is also said to exhibit some unique supernatural qualities such as invisibility and heightened senses that allow it to escape and avoid humans. The Yeti is an ancient and important part of legends, religion, and history of many of the people groups that inhabit the Himalayas. The Sherpa people, made famous for their mountaineering skills and their assistance in guiding tourists to climb Mount Everest, have a deep connection in many legends about the Yeti. The Sherpa seem to sight a bear-like being that inhabits the higher Himalayas as the Yeti, and in Sherpa folklore there are at least three different types of bear-like beings that are identified as Yetis. These beings are known as the Drema, the Chuti, and the Miti. The Drema has red, gray, or black fur and is about the same size as a monkey. They seem to live in groups and seeing them is considered to be a bad omen. According to Serpa legend, hearing their calls can bring misfortune, disease, or death to one's family. The Chuti are described as bear-sized creatures covered in black, gray, or dark red hair. They usually walk on all fours and prey on cattle. They are known as killers of sheep, goats, and yaks. According to biologists, the Drama and Chuti are the Himalayan red bear or the Himalayan brown bear, and some Serpas actually recognize this as such. The third type of yeti, according to the Sherpa, known as the Miti, is described as not a bear at all, and this creature much better matches the more ape-like sightings of the yeti from modern-day descriptions. 
The Miti is said to be the size of a man with reddish or light blonde fur, a pointed head, and hair falling over its face. It is said to walk upright and is known to kidnap humans. In the traditional folk tales of the Sherpa, the Yeti is always a figure of danger. For example, in the story The Annihilation of the Yeti, Sherpas seek revenge on a group of tormenting Yetis. They make a show of drinking alcohol and fighting each other to encourage the Yetis to follow suit and destroy each other in a drunken rage. The Sherpa's plan works, but this does not destroy all the Yetis, leading the surviving Yetis to declare revenge and move up high into the mountains to continue their depredations against the Sherpa people. In another story, a local girl is assaulted by a Yeti and soon loses her health the day after. And in another, a Yeti grows taller and taller as the sun rises and any human that sees him is frozen in fear and loses consciousness and energy. These tales of the Yeti seem to provide a key lesson, specifically warning the Sherpa community about approaching dangerous wild animals. And perhaps these folk tales of the Yeti were also used as a way to make sure children would not wander far away and would always stay close and safe within their community. Some locals also say that the Yeti is just a fear that has been made up inside the head of the mountainous people, which is a way to keep them more aware and wary when on the dangerous mountain terrain. The people of Tibet also have many tales and a number of names for the Yeti, such as the Dremo, which means wild man, the Chumong, which means the spirit of the glaciers, the Mikde or Michi, which means the bear man, the Migoi or Migo, which means the wild man, the Kang Amandi, which means the snowman, and the Tahlo Mung, which means the mountain savage. Tibetan culture describes yetis as much more ape-like rather than bear-like, with long arms, a powerful torso, a conical head, and a body covered in long brown or reddish hair. A yeti's face is said to be hairless with a flat nose, like a primate rather than a protruding nose like a bear, and a yeti is also said to either move on two legs or four legs depending on the ease of journey. All yetis are said to be very hairy and strong and are said to emit a characteristic sound that almost sounds like a whistle, and some Tibetans even say that the yetis possess their own language. Tibetan tales state that yetis live in the alpine forest just below the snow line. But during winter, as food becomes harder to find, they move to lower altitudes and closer to human settlements. Humans then encounter these beings in forested areas or snowy fields, with tales claiming yetis raid cultivated fields, destroy crops, or attack cattle, and in some accounts gathered by anthropologists, they are also known to prey on humans. In many local Tibetan accounts, the yeti also has inverted footprints, kidnaps human beings, and usually tries to imitate human behavior. Numerous legends are told about the man-bear who is believed to carry off its victims, keeping them in an inaccessible cave high in the mountains that the prisoner most likely will have to escape only after many years of captivity. The Lepcha people are said to worship the yeti as the spirit of the hunt, and regard him as the master and protector of all animals who live in the mountain forests. In the Lepchka pantheon, the Chumong, or glacier spirit, is an ape-like creature. The Lepchkas worship the glacier spirit as the god of hunting and lord of all forest beasts. Appropriate offerings have to be made for him before and after the hunt, and many Lepchka hunters have claimed to have met the glacier spirit during their expeditions on the edge of the mountain forests. Some stories tell of the lord of the animals being feared by the Lepchka, and them being pelted with stones and boulders, having trees fall on them, and shivering and shaking in terror upon hearing the eerie whistle of the Hmong. According to Lepchka legend, if you come across a female Hmong, you will never return empty-handed from your hunt, but male Hmong are aggressive and could kill you. However, the hunters state that you will often not see them and may be lucky to see one in your entire lifetime but you will hear their whistles, and once you hear one whistle near you, in a moment if you stand still, you can start hearing whistles from the mountains all around you. In Bhutanese folklore, the Yeti appears as a creature known as the Migoi, a magical creature of the wilds that is simultaneously a supernatural being and a creature invoked to scare children. The Migoi shares several characteristics already attributed to Yeti-like creatures, and also has some additional traits. It can become invisible at will, its blood has magical qualities, and it can be used to create talisman amulets and magic weapons from its bones. In Bhutanese sources, there are actually two different kinds of Yeti-like beings that are found. The Mechume, also known as the Mirgola, 
which is usually described as a small hominid ape-like being with long arms and brownish or reddish hair who is said to inhabit the deep forest slopes of the Himalayas. And the Migoi, who usually stalks the high pastures where herders bring their yaks. The Migoi is described as being a huge being with reddish brown or grayish black hair. In certain tales, the Migoi is also said to have a hollow back. This detail is quite interesting, since like the description of the reversed feet reported in the Tibetan tales, it seems to point towards the world of the dead in India and Nepal. Reversed feet and a hollow back are very common features associated with aggressive and dangerous ghosts. In Bhutanese folklore, Yeti are also said to possess some sorts of magical items such as dipshings, which is a type of charm in the form of a juniper twig, which gives the holder the power to become invisible at will, which has been also a common theme in such Yeti stories in other communities. And the Shim Prasha, a small satchel that without it the Yeti becomes helpless and loses all its power and ability to move. The tales of Bhutan also state the Yeti is a creature that shapes the psychological realities in which people use to make sense of the world and themselves. For many people in the Himalayas, the Yeti is deeply embedded in their understanding of their day-to-day -day lives. In the Bhutanese tales of the Yeti, Chuzang Choden writes, The Yeti is an essential part of the backdrop of our existence in the Himalayas. The Yeti exists for all of time, whether we acknowledge it or not. Our first encounter cannot be dated, for there is no first encounter, since the Yeti has been around for as long as we have, and surely much, much longer. In much of the Yeti folklore in the region, the Yeti is a representative of a dark spirit, and from encounters with the creature arise various moral teachings and spiritual tests of overcoming fear and transcending the unknown. In many Bhutanese legends, the Yeti appears as an apparition in the night, inciting fear in hunters and wanderers. In one story, the Yeti tears a mountain villager limb from limb, and in another, a young girl is cornered into a Yeti's cave, and escapes only by tricking the creature to setting itself on fire. Among the Lopo villagers of Ting Chim, the Yeti is equated with the spirit of the mountain passes, known as the Latsin. The Latsin is one of the most important and versatile classes of supernatural being in Tim Chen. The Latsin are usually smelled or heard rather than seen. Unlike most other Yeti folklore tales, the Latsin are well known for being helpful to monks during the isolation of their meditation retreats and may present firewood and meat at their doorsteps, and may also be protectors of women in the village. Although helpful, the Latsin are also thought to be a root of many causes of illness in the village. However, whenever the mountains, rocky hills, lakes, and small streams of the sacred lands around the village are polluted, its guardian spirits and local deities will become agitated. When the deity Thang Ilha was agitated, there was said to be harm brought by a Latsin. The Hindus relate the Yeti to the monkey god Han Uman, who is depicted as a half-human, half-monkey being. Some Hindus also consider the Yeti to be disciples of Shiva and are thought to be spirits from the sun. The Ban Jakris are also said to be adherent followers of Shiva that wear long black hair possibly to resemble a Yeti. Although the extremely long hair they possess are also reminiscent of those worn by ancient Tibetan black Ban shamans, which also may be another source of inspiration. These many folklore accounts from Himalayan communities and traditions are likely thousands of years old, however due to them being oral histories passed down through the generations, it is impossible to verify when they exactly started. As without a system of writing, the nomadic peoples of the Himalayan mountains had no way to reliably keep records and dates on their encounters and stories regarding the Yeti. This means, oddly enough, the first ever written mention of a Yeti comes from the tales of Alexander the Great's conquest of the Kashmir region in northern India. According to the account, Alexander had heard tales of the wild man-creature in the Himalayan mountains and had demanded the local people to capture one for him. However, the local people explained that it would not be possible for the creature to survive at such a low altitude, and so Alexander dropped the request. Centuries later, Philney the Elder, a Roman biologist and historian, also wrote an account that seems to mention a Yeti-like creature, as it states, Among the mountainous districts of the eastern parts of India in what is called the country of Katharkludi, we find the satyr, an animal of extraordinary swiftness. These satyrs sometimes go on four feet and sometimes walk erect. They are also said to have the features of a human being, 
On the account of their swiftness, these creatures are never to be caught, except when they are either aged or sickly. These creatures are said to screech in a frightful manner. Their bodies are covered with hair, their eyes are of a green sea color, and their teeth are like those of a dog. Tang Chinese manuscripts from the 7th century AD also describe hairy creatures similar to the Yeti. However, some scholars argue this is simply describing a panda. This lack of local written accounts of the Yeti, however, would be resolved when the Tibetan Empire in the 6th century AD, led by its founder Song Gampo, would create a written Tibetan language and also would start the spread of Tibetan Buddhism throughout the Himalayan region with the foundation of many Buddhist temples. This would eventually allow for literate Tibetan Buddhist monks to write down local accounts of the Yeti in manuscripts, while artwork depicting the Yeti would also become common in the region's many Buddhist temples as the Yeti was an important religious figure in Tibetan Buddhism. A tradition likely carried on from the region's traditional religion known as Ban, which according to oral histories also viewed the Yeti as a divine figure, as well as with the followers of Ban believing in the ritual use of Yeti body parts in religious ceremonies. Yeti body parts are found in prescriptions for Ban magical potions which use the blood of the Yeti, which was described as an ape-like creature who carries a large stone as a weapon and makes a whistling sound. The Mani Kabam, an important 12th century religious historical chronicle of the creation of the Tibetan people, exemplifies shared kinship between humans and yetis according to Tibetan religion. According to their chronicle, an ogress met a monkey who was the incarnation of the Buddhist deity of compassion, Sparaskigs, and the two mated. They produced six monkey hybrid human children who became the ancestors of the original six Tibetan clans. They were short and covered with hair and possessed flat red faces, stood erect, and perhaps even had tails. Over the generations, the progeny of the six clan ancestors evolved, becoming more like humans until they developed into the Tibetan people. According to Tibetan oral lore, however, some of these early ancestors did not fully evolve into humans and instead remained as wild people or yetis. Yetis are unlike other non-human animals as they have shared ancestral kinship with humans, but yetis are not fully human either. In the Mani Kabam, they reside in an ambiguous liminal spiritual space, being neither human nor non-human. In Buddhist textual standards derived from India, there is no intermediate realm between the human realm and the animal realm. Nonetheless, many pieces of Tibetan temple art, sometimes in mainline monasteries, often delineate a yeti realm precisely as an intermediate between humans and animals, perhaps reflecting the ancestral human yeti kinship described in the Mani Kabam. This is something to take notice of, as many tales with the yeti in the folklore of the Himalayas also say the creature is more than just a flesh and blood animal, and that the yeti are able to harness supernatural abilities that allow them to appear and disappear at will. While other stories describe the yeti as a presence or feeling rather than a physical creature, these features would seem to line up with the Buddhist accounts of this mysterious Yeti realm and the special powers of the beings within it. In many Tibetan Buddhist temples, there are clearly religious paintings and works that depict Yetis. Interestingly, after the introduction of Buddhism to the Himalayan region, there are many popular folk tales involving Yetis that paint them in a more positive light where typically the pre-Buddhist tales had been exclusively negative. This is likely derived from the Buddhist view of all living things having a purpose and place in the world. In Tibetan Buddhism, people typically view monks who go into isolation to meditate as a sign of religious devotion, and often will freely offer these monks food and water in support of their isolated retreats. In the legend of Sangwa Dorje, in the Pamboshe Monastery, it was a yeti who cared for the isolated monk Sangwa Dorje. This yeti regularly brought Sangwa Dorje food, water, and fuel, and even became his Buddhist disciple. When the yeti died, Sangwa Dorje retained the alleged scalp of the creature, and this scalp and a supposed hand from the creature remained in the Panboshe Monastery when it was founded in 1677. For centuries afterwards, the Drogon Lamas, who were the successors to Sangwa Dorje's leadership, periodically would parade the yeti scalp around the village in a fertility ritual to bless the people, animals, houses, and fields, a practice that would continue until the lineage of the Drogon Lamas had recently moved to India due to persecution. However, the yeti hand and scalp have remained housed as sacred relics in the monastery.
As remarkable as it is to think that yetis can be Buddhist practitioners, the story of Sangwa Dorji is not isolated, and other notions of religious yetis exist in the region. There is a Bhutanese tale which describes a group of yetis serving as Buddhist shrine attendants. In the dead of night and away from the prying eyes of humans, a small group of yetis maintained a village temple devoted to the protective deity Pam Den Lamo. Each night, the yetis would arrive, clean, and refill the offering bowls on the altar, replenish the butter in the temple butter lamps, and then disappear before sunrise. Like the yeti in the story of Lama Sangwa Dorji, these yetis perform Buddhist bodhisattva deeds and acts of Buddhist devotion. There is also the story of the Grateful Yeti, which is also quite well known in the region, possessing several variants across Himalayan communities. In this legend, a Tibetan Buddhist yogi wandered through the mountains. Then one day he was crippled by an attack of gout and was unable to walk. He established himself in a pleasant place at the edge of the forest where he found some goats who eventually followed him everywhere like pets. There he remained. On the other side of the hill where he was staying, there were some abandoned shacks. Every day, he would see a huge dark man coming and going from the shacks in the river. Apart from this, there is no other signs of life in the area. One week, he no longer noticed his strange neighbor on his daily walk. Having become intrigued by that mysterious man and feeling a bit better, the yogi decided to investigate the man's dilapidated dwelling. Inside, the yogi was startled to come face to face with the migoi, or wild man, as the Tibetans call the yeti. The behemoth was lying outstretched on the floor, eyes closed and fangs apart, seemingly unaware of the intrusion, and he was feverishly ill. One of the yeti's feet was grossly swollen and full of pus. The yogi immediately noticed protruding from the infected area of the vast foot a sharp splinter of wood that could easily be removed. He thought, I know he can jump out and devour me at any moment, but I have come this far I might as well try to help the poor creature. While he gently extracted the long splinter, the yeti, now aware that the lama was helping him, lay still. The kindly yogi cautionally cleaned away the pus. He washed the wound using his own saliva as salve and then bandaged the foot with a rag from his own clothing. The yogi then quietly left the shack and returned to his goats, which had been tied to a tree in the forest. Days afterward, he saw the yeti limping down to the river, presumably for water, and slowly returning to its house. Eventually, the creature's gait improved to the point where he could walk without difficulty. Miraculously enough, the yogi's crippling gout had also began to subside so that his painful stride began to return to normal until he was completely cured, and after that, he no longer saw the yeti. One day, the ferocious yeti suddenly leapt down from the trees, grimaced at the yogi, then sprang back into the trees and was gone. A few days later, the same thing happened, but this time the yeti was carrying a dead tiger on his shoulder placing the magnificent carcass in front of the yogi as a token of gratitude. The yeti then bounded off into the dense jungle and was never seen again. The yogi did not wish to eat the meat, but he carefully skinned the beautiful beast with meticulous care. Eventually, upon his return to the Sinchen Monastery, he offered the splendid tiger skin to the monastery for use during tantric rites. Despite these new and more relatively positive Buddhist stories, yetis were still regarded as very dangerous to humans by the local people and are documented as emerging as incarnations of mountain deities in the context of Himalayan folk religion and Tibetan Buddhism. Many Himalayan people consider a great mountain in their vicinity to be the abode of their local deity. In fact, in Tibetan folk belief, great mountains are deities who happen to just appear as mountains. Such deities reward the local community for good behavior and discipline it for negative behavior, thus keeping order in social groups through various taboos and restrictions. It is widely thought that a displeased deity will distribute punishment by sending out a physical embodiment of the deity in the guise of a strong ape-like yeti. This mountain deity yeti is a continuation of the idea of the Raksha, of Indian Hindu and Buddhist myth and enforces discipline by bringing illness, property damage, and death to those who disobey. This is why among the many Buddhist artworks of the revered Drimong Monastery in Lhasa, Tibet, one can find a mural painting like this one, showing a yeti carrying a decapitated human corpse. This makes it quite clear that the community still had a great amount of respect and fear of the yeti up until the modern era. However, these accounts and stories of the Yeti would remain obscure and only widely known in the Himalayas where they originated for hundreds of years. It was not until Western explorers began exploring the Himalayas in the 18th century that the tales of the Yeti would start to reach out into the broader world. The first mention of the Yeti in the West is in 1832, 
when James Princeps Journal of the Asiatic Society of Bengal published trekker B. H. Hodgson's account of his experiences in northern Nepal. Hodgkin's local guide spotted a tall bipedal creature covered with long dark hair which seemed to flee in fear. Hodgson concluded that it was an orangutan. An early record of footprints appeared in 1899 in Lawrence Waddles among the Himalayas. Waddle reported his guide's description of a large ape-like creature that left the prints, which Waddle thought were made by a bear. Waddle had heard stories of the bipedal ape-like creatures, but had wrote that, None of the many Tibetans I have interrogated on this subject could ever give me an authentic case. On the most superficial investigation, it was always resolved into something that somebody heard or was told about. The famous name, the Abominable Snowman, was coined in 1921 when Lieutenant Colonel Charles Howard Berry led the 1921 British Mount Everest Reconnaissance Expedition, which he chronicled in the Mount Everest the Reconnaissance book. In the book, Howard Berry includes an account crossing the Lap Kala at 21,000 feet or 6,400 meters, where he found footprints that he believed were probably caused by a large loping gray wolf, which in the soft snow formed double tracks rather than those like a barefooted man. However, his Sherpa guides at once volunteered that the tracks must be that of the wild man of the snows, which they gave the name of the Mito Kongmi. Mito translates as man bear, and Kongmi translates as snowman. After seeing the tracks, the Sherpas also reportedly expressed a great desire to move out of the area as quickly as possible. The name Abominable Snowman actually comes from confusion that occurred during Howard Berry's recollection of the term Mito Kongmi, and the term used in Bill Tillman's book Mount Everest in 1938, where Tillman used the words Mech, which does not exist in the Tibetan language, and Kongmi, when relating the coining of the term Abominable Snowman. The word mech is impossible to spell in Tibetan because the consonants T, C, H cannot be conjoined in the Tibetan language. Documentation suggests that the term mech kongmi is derived from only one source from that year in 1921. This suggests that the word mech is likely just a misspelling of the word mito. The use of the name of abominable snowman then began when Henry Newman, a longtime contributor to the Statesman in Calcutta, interviewed the porters of the Everest Reconnaissance Expedition on their return from Darjeeling. Newman mistranslated the word mito as filthy, substituting the term abominable, perhaps out of artistic license. As author Bill Tillman recounts, Newman wrote long letters to the Times and the whole story seemed to be a joyous creation and I sent it to only one or two newspapers. The frequencies of sightings of yetis increased during the early 20th century when Westerners began making determined attempts to scale the many mountains in the area, most notably Mount Everest, and occasionally reported seeing odd creatures or tracks. In 1925, Nicholas Tombazi, a photographer and member of the Royal Geographical Society, writes that he saw a creature about 15,000 feet or 4,600 meters near Zimu Glacier, later writing that he observed the creature from about 200 to 300 yards, or 180 to 170 meters, for about a minute. Tombazi stated, unquestionably, the figure in the outline was exactly like a human being, walking upright and stopping occasionally to pull at some dwarf bushes. It showed up against the dark snow, and as far as I could make out, it wore no clothes. About two hours later, Tombazi and his companions descended the mountain and saw the creature's prints described as similar in shape to those of a man, but only 6-7 to seven inches long by 4 inches wide. According to Tom Bazzi, the prints were undoubtedly those of a biped. While these accounts drew interest from the outside world, ultimately the chaos of the Great Depression and World War II would delay any further attempts for explorers to climb Mount Everest and to search for the elusive Yeti for several decades. It was then after the war that Western interest in the Yeti and climbing the Great Mountain dramatically increased in the 1950s. While attempting to scale Mount Everest in 1951, Eric Shipton took photographs of a number of large prints in the snow at about 6,000 meters or 20,000 feet above sea level. These photos, dubbed as Shipton photos, have been subject to intense scrutiny and debate. Some argue that they are the best evidence of the Yeti's existence, while others contend that the prints are those of a bear that have been distorted by the melting snow. And despite the controversy, these photos captured worldwide attention and publicity. After the Shipton photos, dozens of reports, which included hunched dark shapes disappearing over ridgelines, huge baffling tracks crossing remote alpine snowfields, looming shadows appearing in blizzards, and even yaks with their heads screwed off by a beast were all reported. This would lead to many groups setting up serious scientific expeditions to search for the legendary Yeti. 
During the Daily Mail Snowman Expedition of 1954, the mountaineering leader John Angelo Jackson made the first trek from Everest to Kanchenju John in course, which he photographed a symbolic painting of the Yeti at the Tang Boshe Gampa Monastery. Jackson tracked and photographed many footprints in the snow, most of which were identifiable. However, there were many large footprints which could not be identified. These flattened footprint-like indentations were attributed to erosion and subsequent widening of the original footprint by wind and particles. In 1954, the Daily Mail also printed an article which described the expedition teams obtaining hair specimens from what was alleged to be a yeti scalp found in the Panboche Monastery. This is the same legendary scalp of Sanguadorji's friendly yeti that was mentioned earlier, a relic that the monks of the monastery had cared for for hundreds of years. The monks were even kind enough to let the explorers take a few hairs to be examined by scientists. The hairs were black to dark brown in color in dim light and fox red in sunlight. The hair was analyzed by Professor Frederick Wood Jones, an expert in human and comparative anatomy. During the study, the hairs were bleached and cut into sections and analyzed microscopically. The research consisted of taking mycto-pictographs of the hairs and comparing them with hairs from known animals, such as bears and orangutans. Jones concluded that the hairs were not actually from a scalp. He contended that while some animals do have a ridge of hair extending from the pate to the back, no animals have a ridge, as in the Panboche scalp, running from the base of the forehead across the pate and ending at the nape of the neck. Jones was unable to pinpoint the exact animal from which the Panboche hairs were taken. He was convinced, however, that the hairs were not of a bear or any anthropoid ape. He suggested that the hairs were likely from the shoulder of a coarse-haired hoofed animal, likely one of the yaks or mountain goats common to the region. Beginning in 1957, Tom Slick funded a few missions to investigate Yeti reports. In 1957, supposed Yeti feces were collected by one of Tom Slick's expeditions. Fecal analysis found a parasite which had not been classified, but the actual feces had been identified to have come from a brown bear. The United States government at the time thought that finding the Yeti was likely enough to create three rules for an American expedition searching for it. First, obtain a Nepalese permit. Second, do not harm the Yeti except in self-defense. And third, let the Nepalese government improve any news reporting on the animal's discovery. In 1960, Sir Edmund Hillary mounted the Silver Hut expedition to the Himalayas, which was to collect and analyze physical evidence of the Yeti. Hillary borrowed another alleged Yeti scalp from the Kenshong Monastery, then himself and Kenshmo Chumbi, the village headman, brought the scalp back to London, where a small sample was cut off for testing. A detailed examination of the sample skin and hair from the margin of the alleged Yeti scalp, and a comparison from similar samples from Acero, Blue Bear, and Black Bear, Burns concluded that the sample was probably made from the skin of an animal closely resembling this sampled species of Acero or another type of goat, but definitely not identical with it, possibly a local variety or a race of the same species, or different but closely related species in the area. Belief in the Yeti was at an all-time high in the 1960s, and in Bhutan, in 1966, a stamp was made to commemorate the creature, and the Yeti had actually broken into popular culture throughout the world, with depictions in horror movies to children Christmas specials. Another major reported sighting occurred in 1970 when British mountaineer Don Wilhans claimed to have witnessed a creature when scaling Annapurna, and he reported that he saw it moving on all fours, a first for modern reports. In 1983, Himalayan conservationist Daniel C. Taylor and Himalayan natural historian Robert L. Fleming Jr. led a Yeti expedition into Nepal's Barun Valley. The Taylor Fleming expedition also discovered similar Yeti like footprints intriguing large nests and trees, and vivid reports from local villagers of two bears, the tree bear, which was relatively smaller, and the larger ground bear. Further interviews across Nepal gave evidence in local belief in two different bears. Skulls were collected, and these were compared to known skulls at the Smithsonian Institute, the American Museum of Natural History, and the British Museum, and were confirmed to be the identification of a single species, the Asiatic black bear showing no differences between the tree bear and ground bear specimens except age. And despite several major zoological discoveries, there was still no yeti. People would continue to search for the yeti throughout the 90s, but it would not be until the 2000s when advanced DNA gathering technology and new archaeological discoveries would provide a new angle to approach the yeti mystery.
For instance, the discovery of the Denisovans, an extinct species of human known from a few fragmentary remains from a cave in Siberia and remains that were only discovered in 2008, yet genetic analysis suggested that they had survived for hundreds of thousands of years, only dying out about 40,000 years ago. Another lost species of human that had endured until more recently, the diminutive hobbits of Homo floriensis, may have also survived in Indonesia up until just about 12,000 years ago. That suggests that there might be other populations of humanoid-like creatures to learn about. Another more recent theory that has arose is that the reported creatures known as the Yeti could be present-day specimens of an extinct giant ape known as Gigantopithecus. However, the Yeti is generally described as bipedal, and most scientists believe Gigantopithecus to have been quadrupedal. Gigantopithecus was so massive that unless it was evolved specifically to be a bipedal ape, walking upright would have been even more difficult for the now extinct primate than it would have been for its extant quadrupedal relative, the orangutan. In 2014, Brian Sykes, a former professor of genetics at the University of Oxford in the United Kingdom, decided to test some samples from supposed yetis. He and his team analyzed hair samples from anomalous primates said to be yetis, and then compared the Yeti DNA with genomes of other known animals. The team found that the two Himalayan hair samples, one from Ladakh in India and the other from Bhutan, were most genetically similar to a polar bear that lived about 40,000 years ago. This initially suggested that the Himalayas were home to an as-of-yet-unknown bear, a hybrid of an ancient polar bear and a brown bear. If these bears are as widely distributed in the Himalayas, they might well contribute to the biological foundation of the Yeti legend, the team wrote. However, this claim quickly ran into trouble. Polar bears in the Himalayas sounded like a really cool thing, says Ross Barnett at the University of Copenhagen in Denmark, but he decided to double-check Sykes and his colleagues and had put all their data DNA into a public database called GenBank, and it was really easy to download and verify. Upon further inspection, they found a big mistake. There wasn't an exact match to a Pleistocene polar bear, but the match was more to a modern-day polar bear, and the matches were actually very slight. This suggested a much less exciting explanation. Instead of a secret population of polar bears living in the Himalayas, Barnett and Edwards concluded that the DNA from the hares had been damaged, likely from a brown bear. This does happen. Hair is a good source of ancient DNA because creatine keeps harmful water away from DNA, but it can degrade, especially in the harsh conditions provided by the Himalayas. The study has since been replicated again by Elsier Gutierrez of the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C., and Ronald Pine of the University of Kansas in Lawrence. After comparing the DNA sequences, they also found no reason to believe that the two Yeti samples came from anything other than brown bears. The most recent piece of noteworthy Yeti evidence was collected in April of 2019 after an Indian Army mountaineering expedition team claimed to have spotted mysterious Yeti footprints measuring 81 by 38 centimeters near the Maluk II base camp in Ladakh, India. This is noteworthy as a major international government took this situation very seriously. However, after a thorough search by the Indian Army, there was no Yeti to be found. And as of the recording of this video, there is still not any concrete proof of the existence of the Yeti. However, people still go looking for the Yeti in the Himalayas. Until this day, there are still photographs in the snow, DIY-style films, granny photographs, and eyewitness accounts from mountaineers being taken and occurring often. So what exactly is the Yeti? According to mountaineer Reinhold Messner, who is perhaps one of the most famous Yeti hunters of all, and claims to have seen one in the Himalayas in the 1980s, and has returned dozens of times to get to the bottom of the mystery, he has one simple answer. The Yeti is a bear. Mesner argues that the Yeti legend is a combination of real bear species and Sherpa tales about the dangers of wild animals. All the Yeti footprints are from the same species of brown bear, says Mesner. The Yeti isn't a fantastic figure. There is something making footprints in the snow up in those mountains. The Yeti is reality. We are just trying to figure out what the Yeti is. People don't like reality, they like crazy stories, says Mesner. They like that the Yeti is a Neanderthal or the Yeti is a mix between humans and apes. But from all my years spent here and all the evidence collected, it points to the Himalayan brown bear. The Himalayan brown bear does indeed match up quite well to the profile of the Yeti. It is a genetically distinct species that diverged about 600,000 years ago from the modern day brown bear. Weighing between 300 and 600 pounds and being 5 to 7 feet tall when standing on their hind legs, this also matches the traditional description of the Yeti's weight and size quite well. The bears are also a reddish brown to gray color, which matches the traditional folklore description of the Yeti's color. 
The Himalayan brown bear is also an apex predator and is more than ferocious and large enough to inspire the stories of yeti attacks on humans and livestock alike. So when a witness is viewing one of these bears standing from a considerable distance in bad weather and a dense forest combined with the altitude of the region which can cause even seasoned mountaineers and hikers to experience low oxygen levels and hallucinations after long days of traversing the rugged terrain. So if a witness sees one of these bears on its hind legs, it would be quite understandable for a witness to believe they are looking at a humanoid figure rather than a bear, especially if they are familiar with the region's folklore about the creature. The Himalayan brown bear's range is also perfectly aligned with the locations where yeti sightings occur and they have even been known to travel on the high snow and boulder fields in the Himalayan mountains as a way to move between fertile valleys in search of food. The yeti is also said to travel this way between valleys on these snow fields and consequently this is almost where all instances of yeti footprints have been discovered. And the bears place their back paws in the impressions of their front paws which reduces the difficulty of walking through heavy snow above the tree line. These doubled up tracks when modified by snow melt from the sun can look like large human footprints rather than those of a bear and are likely the explanation for yeti footprints. It is also notable to recall that many of the local names of the yeti in the region refer to the yeti's bear-like qualities such as the Mito Kongmi which translates as man bear snowman. A 2017 analysis of DNA extracted from a supposed mummified yeti also was shown to have been DNA from a Himalayan brown bear. Another reason skeptics dismiss the yeti as a large bipedal primate-like creature is the lack of evidence of primate habitation in the region's forests and caves. Signs of primates and other big animals are hard to miss, even if they are uncommon. When you look at primate species that are rare, like bonobos and orangutans, the evidence is still all around and easy to spot, which includes things such as nests, branch breaks, and other things, which are clearly lacking in the forests of the Himalayas. There are places in the Himalayas where a population of large apes could theoretically survive, but these places have lots of people living off the land where all local species of mammals larger than a rat would regularly be hunted by various means. Animals as large as the yeti would need to roam widely to find enough food, which means they would struggle to stay hidden from hunters and farmers alike. The climate of the Himalayas is also an issue. Any large primate would struggle in the harsh Himalayan weather. Even hardy Japanese macaques, the most cold-tolerant primates known, have to descend into subtropical forests in winter. If we were to assume yetis follow behavior similar to other primates, that would surely mean their discovery. As the forests of the Himalayas now exist as small patches, most of them have been cleared out for agriculture in recent years. Despite this, the yeti or any physical evidence of its existence stubbornly refuse to show up. The final point that must be mentioned that may cast doubts on the yeti being an unknown ape-like creature is the active economic interest of the Himalayan region to maintain belief in the creature. Tourism is a major part of the economies of the villages of the Himalayas, with the majority of the tourists coming to climb the world's tallest mountains and admire the natural beauty, and Buddhists coming to the region on religious pilgrimage. However, since the 1950s, summer trips to the mountains to look for yetis has also become a popular pastime among rich westerners. This resulted in many villages in the mountains having a designated yeti witness whose job was to tell visitors tall tales, guide them to remote valleys where sightings were supposedly taking place, and then charge them a lot of money for their service. And while certainly many witness accounts are likely honest interpretations of what they saw, it would be hard to base a case for the Yeti's existence solely on the accounts of eyewitnesses who have a vested economic interest in the public's continued belief in the creature's existence. Despite the many valid points from skeptics casting doubt on a species of unknown primate living high in the Himalayas, there are still some valid arguments for a case for the creature's possible existence, the most obvious being the depictions of Yetis from old Buddhist art in the region. As we explained earlier, it is likely that many yeti sightings could be attributed to misidentification of the Himalayan brown bear. However, the artwork in Buddhist monasteries that is hundreds of years old clearly shows an ape-like creature and not a bear. These depictions, combined with hundreds of eyewitness sightings from locals and foreigners continuing to this day, if even a fraction of them are accurate, this may hint to there being a creature still out there that modern science is unaware of. Indeed, the Himalayan mountains and the surrounding valleys have some of the most rugged and isolated terrain on Earth and are more than capable of sustaining and hiding a large unknown primate. And while it is unlikely that an unknown species has remained undetected for this long, it may be possible that a small population has remained undetected and may continue to do so, especially if they do indeed have the supernatural capabilities that the folklore of the region attributes to them. In summation, there is currently no hard evidence of the existence of an unknown primate in the Himalayas. 
It seems that bears might be well involved in the Yeti legend with the most likely explanation of the Yeti being misinterpretations of animals like brown bears combined with the human tendency to tell tall tales about unknown animals. However, the Himalayas are a massive and mysterious region that may still be capable of hiding something. But whether the Yeti is a real flesh and blood creature or not does not diminish its importance to the Himalayan region. The more fierce accounts of the creature instill a healthy respect for wild animals and the hazardous weather in the mountains, while the more kind accounts of the Yeti emphasize the Buddhist religious belief in all creatures of the world having a place and purpose. The Yeti has also become a world-famous cultural icon and a permanent part of humanity's mythical history. The Yeti can be found in media of all kinds, just like the local Himalayan stories they are depicted as having a fierce side as well as a kinder, gentler side and have undoubtedly inspired the imaginations of many. And despite the lack of hard evidence for the Yeti's existence, that will probably not mean the end for the search of the Yeti. As long as there is still someone who is skeptical and still willing to search, and as long as we humans enjoy hearing legends, there is little doubt we will forget the Yeti, and the search will continue. Thank you for watching my documentary on the history of the Yeti. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like and subscribe for more history content. As the analytics show, almost 99% of you are likely not subscribed, so please subscribe and help this channel grow. Please comment below if you would like to see a specific topic covered in the video and I might get around to it. Thank you.